Okay, I'm going to go ahead and start everyone. Thanks so much for being here today. Um, we're really, really excited to present this webinar from the University of Cincinnati Alumni Association and the College of Nursing at UC uh, presented by Mandy Cafasso. We're really excited because she's a, a dynamite professor. Uh, we're really, you know, just really excited to have her. So um, the, the topic today is nurses and health policy and why we need to be involved and Mandy has a plethora of experience in this area and, you know, to have her be able to talk about these things is going to make a huge difference on what you're going to be able to learn today and things like that. So with that said, here's a, a little bit of Mandy's bio and I'll let her um, take it off from there. So she's a pediatric nurse pr um, <clears throat> practitioner at Cincinnati Children's Hospital and an assistant professor in the DNP program here at the University of Cincinnati. Uh, Mandy has been involved in health policy and advocacy advocacy efforts on behalf of Ohio's APRN since um, starting her career as an NP back in 2005. So she's been doing this a while. Um, she's the legislative chair for the Ohio chapter of the National Association of Pediatric Nurse Practitioners, um, chair of the OAAPN's Key Person Initiative, and, in the, and is the Southwest Regional Co-Director of the OAAPN Board. Um, she's also a member of the nominating committee for the Pediatric Endocrine Society. So, uh, very, very happy to have Mandy on today. And if she has more to add to her bio, I'll let her go from there. But thank you so much, Mandy. And the floor is yours. Great. Thank you, Gage. Um, I appreciate you um, inviting me to speak and the UC Fund and Alumni Foundation um, to, to be able to talk about this. Um, nurses and health policy and why we need to be involved should be something that we discuss um, in, in every class and all of our preparation um, of nurses. Um, and it really doesn't seem to get as much focus as it should. So I uh, love to have any experience to talk about, you know, why I became involved and, um, and why I think all nurses should be involved. Let me see if I can get this to move. There we go. Okay, so I just wanted to start off a little bit um, explaining it. why am I here? I mean, Gage gave you my kind of backgrounds, but really just wanted to kind of explain more about how I got into those roles and um, why I'm always eager to speak to nurses about the importance of advocacy. So as an advanced practice nurse in pediatrics, um, it became evident to me really early in my career that there were a lot of policy barriers to the care that I wanted to be able to provide to my patients. Um, there were uh, policies within the hospital system that were um, a barrier. There were policies within the Board of Nursing with prescribing abilities for pediatric patients. I worked in liver and small bowel transplants. We used a lot of medications that were off-label at the time that I started my career, um, which made it difficult for me to prescribe. Um, as many people are probably aware, um, we couldn't write for home care. So, you know, upon discharge, that became even more of a challenge for me to have my patients prepared appropriately um, for discharge and make sure that they had everything that they, they really wanted. So I became very passionate about the need to change something. Um, and through my career, I've had the opportunity to really serve in, in various roles as Gage ha has um, had shared. But I just wanted to share some of um, some of the photos of places that I've been. So I, I've been able to go to, I've been blessed to go to the Nurse in Washington internship, um, which we'll talk about a little bit later on. Um, so I was able to go to Capitol Hill on Nurses Day, which was amazing um, experience. I have spoken at um, the State House um, for NDASH or Nurses State, the State House, which again, we'll talk a little bit about later. Um, and then through my doctoral training, I was able to spend an entire day um, with Senator Joe Euchre, who basically took me under his wing and allowed me to just sit next to him all day <laughs> in every meeting that I was allowed in, um, he took me to. And we we had a lot of um, a lot of really great conversations about where his knowledge base was and how he could be um, a better proponent of healthcare um, a, a, as the bills crossed his desk. So it was really um, an, an enlightening experience and I learned a lot from him that day. Um, so our objectives for today um, with that said are just gonna be basically to look at the role of the nurse advocate for the profession. What are we, What is it we're supposed to be doing? Um, we'll talk a little bit about some of the health policy issues that can be influenced by nurses and some of the concerns of reasons why we should be more involved. And then we'll explore some methods to become a little bit more adept in healthcare policy um, and advocacy efforts um, moving forward. 
So let's start by just kind of exploring the term advocacy. Um, there's a lot of definitions of advocacy and the meaning really encompasses um, aspects of human nature. So when we think about advocacy as a concept, um, it really can be defined differently based on the individual. Um, and it can be based on their experience or their perceptions. Uh, most people really have an innate desire to do what's right and to fight for what's right. So when I was kind of looking over definitions, um, I found that this definition really fit what I see advocacy as. So it can be the act of defending or arguing in favor of something such as a cause, idea, or policy, and is therefore a way to train citizens and professionals to be agents of change and nurture the desire of making a difference. So by nature, this is really what nurses do every day that we're in practice. Um, Anytime we call a doctor about an order, anytime we call an insurance company for prior authorization for a procedure or for a prescription, those are times that we're acting as an advocate. So when we teach others about inadequacies in care, we're really beginning the grassroots advocacy venture. That's that's what we're doing. So, you know, when our patients see us fighting for them, we're, we're showing them what we're capable of and that we can make change. Um, as I started to really prepare through for this lecture, I wanted to, to kind of bring up the point that um, while advocacy is, is a definition in and of itself or a concept in and of itself, we see a lot of synonyms or a lot of terms embedded in nursing that um, allude to advocacy. So as we kind of move through the next few slides, I want to want to bring to your attention, like looking for words such as assist or advance or promote. So these are all methods of being an advocate for our profession. So the concept of advocacy, it's been around for centuries. This is not something new. It really, it began as far back, first mentioned in the Ming Dynasty. So that was when they were really looking at influencing people to have individual rights. Um, it wasn't really until the 1950s that healthcare advocacy became um, something that people were interested in. And it really um, centered around cancer research and treatments at that point in time. And then it became even more um, um, obvious, I guess, in the healthcare environment in the 80s when we started to learn about HIV and AIDS and um, to learn about patient rights as far as um, treatments were concerned there. But nursing, however, introduced this concept way before all of that. So if you look back at the Code of Ethics written by the American Association of Nurses, this was in 1926. So this is still the foundation and the crux of what we do as nurses. Um, and so we're going to look a little bit into the Code of Ethics that drive our profession still to this day. And we're going to focus specifically today on provision three, which is the nurse promotes, advocates for, and protects the rights, health, and safety of patients. And then we're also going to look at provision nine, which is the profession of nursing collectively through its professional organizations must articulate nursing values, maintain the integrity of the profession, and integrate principles of social justice into nursing and health policy. So while we're only going to really spend today's time on these two provisions, provisions of the Code of Ethics, really encourage everyone to explore the interpretive statements for the rest of the code, because if you bear in mind those synonyms that I introduced to you earlier on, you'll find that really advocacy is embedded in almost every single one of those interpretive statements and provisions written in the Code of Ethics. So let's look a little more closely at that provision three. The interpretive statements um, associated with this provision are really focused mainly on the component of patient privacy and, um, and safety. And so this is really not anything that should be surprising to any of us that have, have been at the bedside as a nurse or worked in the healthcare industry. Um, it specifically relates to the role of the nurse as a protector of privacy and that they should employ, employ standards um, set by the code to be involved in the development of policies protecting patient information. And so when we're acting on HIPAA, when we know we're not supposed to talk in the elevator about patients, those types of things that we um, portray as nurses, that we're going we're gonna to protect your privacy, we're not going to talk about you. Those are things that are embedded within the code of ethics, and we're serving as an advocate in that role. The, the second statement explains the role of the nurse as a protector of rights and research. So thinking about the nurse supporting the patient, if they decide they want to withdraw from a research study, because it's really up to them to identify what the right choice is for them for treatment of their condition. 
And then the fifth interpretive statement really looks at a slightly different angle when approaching um, nursing and patient safety. So this one really talks a lot about how um, we need to be recorders of um, unsafe practices of our peers. So this interpretive statement alludes to the times when we see others acting in an unsafe manner. Um, it discusses the responsibility of nursing associations and supporting nurses who report their peers. And then the very final one is the acceptance of those nurses back into the profession after they have sought um, corrections and um, treatment for whatever was causing the problem in the first place. Um, so these are all encompass, um, not only do they encompass patient care, but they encompass the care of each other in the profession of nursing. If we look at provi provision nine, um, in the code of ethics, it's about advocating for the profession of nursing. So it takes a little bit of a shift in a different direction. Of the interpretive statements in this provision, I think 9.3 um, is probably the one that stands out to me the most. Um, it really recommends that nurses are vigilant and take action to influence leaders, legislators, um, governmental agencies, non-governmental agencies, and all areas related to health affairs that influence the social determinants of health. So again, we'll get into some of the um, current um, issues that are going on where this plays a, a major role and why we need to serve as nurse advocates. Additionally, Interpretive Statement 9.4, um, it discusses the importance of nurses advocating for the profession as policies are developed. So we're all aware that nursing scholarship and research can play a major role in the delivery of healthcare and can impact the creation of policies that influence the care we provide to our patients. But we also can influence and guide the policies that are written regarding um, training of nurses, um, new nurses, specialty nurses. So there's a lot of areas where we can be involved that way. And as, as we see healthcare um, make a, a shift into an environment where there's more and more specialties um, surfacing, um, this is something that becomes very important. I really like this quote. Um, so my kids, when they were much, much younger, loved the movie, The Lorax. And so I use this quote um, in most of the lectures that I give for advocacy, because I think it really is just, it's, 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 it's just the obvious um, statement. So unless someone like you cares a whole awful lot, nothing is going to get better. It's not. And that really is the crux of advocacy. If you have a passion or a drive or you want to do what's right and you want to fight for what's right, you really are an advocate. And if you think back to just the provisions we've talked about up to this point, nurses are professional advocates. That's what we do. That's, that's the foundation of, of nursing. One of the things that I think is really interesting, um, as I move through my academic preparation, there was a significant focus on the Institute of Medicine Future of Nursing Report. And so most people have probably seen this written in 2010, Leading Change Advancing Health, um, a statement that nurses should be full partners with physicians and other healthcare professionals and redesigning healthcare in the United oh, States. Yeah. <laughs> the interesting thing is that this was, um, this is not a new concept. As we just talked about the code of ethics, which was written in 1926, already alluded to this. Um, so for nearly a century, there's been an ask of the nursing community to be more involved in health policy. Yet we still struggle to gain momentum on healthcare. If we think about just even um, as an example, this last general assembly, and we'll get into a little bit more of this as I move into the lecture, but we just now got the nursing license compact, um, which began in 2000. So we're over two decades ago, this initiative was, was something that was started. It took 22 years for Ohio to, to um, be in agreement with that, with that compact. So, um, so we move at a very snail pace. <laughs> um, and so we need to get things moving a little faster. Um, for those of us who are in the business of educating nurses, even the American Academy of Colleges of Nursing um, allude to the foundation of nursing based on advocacy. So nearly every single domain of the new domains released in 2001 um, relate to the role of nursing as an advocate. So most traditionally, we see the role of a nurse um, to provide patient-centered care, and that's not you know, a surprise to anybody. It's really in line with domain number two, which is just that person-centered care. This domain discusses the role of the nurse as we have already discussed it in the promotion of health and well-being, but also the support of autonomy and choice for the patients. 
However, the other domains listed, they also discuss advocacy and services, but they have a slightly different concept within their, um, within their competencies. So for instance, with domain four, scholarship for nursing discipline, these competencies really identify the importance of advocating for patient protection and research. Um, they look at equity and care issues. Um, they also look at advocating for the contributions of nursing practice within interdisciplinary teams, which is a little bit different than what we saw in those um, basic provisions through the ANA. So why should we get involved or why should you get involved? Um, the old adage, strength in numbers, really no doubt plays a role here. Um, and, and if we look across the United States, there's over 3 million registered nurses that are currently employed active nurses. Um, there are over 300,000 of those nurses that are uh, advanced practice registered nurses. So consider the impact that we could have on policy at the federal level if only 10% of those nurses were actively involved. Um, I was looking for the, the number and somebody online may, may know it, but um, it was years ago, I remember hearing less than 2% of nurses were registered to vote. So thinking about the impact that we could have um, if we come together to show why changes in policy are important, why the barriers to care are keeping us um, from providing the best care we can to patients. Um, and also thinking about just in Ohio alone, if we could get people more involved in Ohio, we have over 200,000 registered nurses and 23,000 of those are advanced practice nurses. So across the healthcare industry, um, nursing is the largest profession, um, but the need for nurses is outpacing those who are leaving the field. So basically what we're finding is that, especially since the pandemic, there's been a 40% um, shift in nursing, nurses leaving the field. And then we're finding that a lot of nurses are retiring early as well. So really, we need to make circumstances better for our nurses in the workforce. And if we reflect back on that provision 9.1 of the Code of Ethics, we need to really make the public aware of what we're doing, the value of nursing, and to promote the profession in an effort to influence workforce development, um, safe nurse-patient ratios, and, and other policy initiatives that can improve the care that we provide to our patients. So I love this um, one. Hopefully you guys have seen this before. Um, the Gallup poll, this has been conducted since 1976, and it looks at various characteristics of professions. For the past 20 years, nurses have ranked as the top most trusted profession for honesty and ethics. So this might not be a surprise to, to us as nurses because we know what we do. <laughs> but um, what I find surprising is that we rely on lobbyists to go and speak on our behalf. And if you look at the bottom of this list for honesty and ethics, that's where the lobbyists currently sit. So why are we allowing the people who are least trusted go in and speak on our behalf to create policy and make change in healthcare? So let's talk a little bit about some current issues um, that we've seen in healthcare. So with the landscape of healthcare continuously changing, um, there's usually three primary issues that we see year after year. And those issues are access to care, scope of practice, and cost of healthcare. So there is some overlap regarding these issues, which is unavoidable, and it can also make policy seem a little more convoluted um, than it may already seem, especially if you're not um, very intimately involved with policy. And But looking at the Agency for Healthcare Research and Quality, they define access to care to include um, coverage, which is really the ability to be a healthcare consumer, um, service, which is in relation to primary care and preventative care, timeliness or the ability of you to be able to go and seek um, care when you're sick or when you're injured and to be able to have that care in that time frame. And then also looking at workforce, which is just really in regard to the capability and preparedness of the person that you see when you do seek care. Ohio just began our 135th General Assembly. So we're still awaiting introduction of legislation, which gives policymakers really two years to convince others of the necessity of, to address the issues at hand. Um, and the last General Assembly 
in Ohio, there were three pieces of legislation that I want to highlight here that were introduced and had direct impact on the access to care related to service, timeliness, and workforce, as we saw in that definition. House Bill 221 is the Better Access to Better Care Act, and it was actually um, on its fourth introduction in a General Assembly, which mean it means it's been at the state house introduced for at least eight years and hopefully we'll be having this legislation coming forth um, shortly as well um, so it'll start its next cycle um, and this bill really seeks to remove the standard collaborative agreement for um, aprns in the state of ohio so nurse practitioners in the state of ohio that can provide primary care, specialty services, and reduce emergency room visits currently have to have a st standard collaborative agreement with a physician. And this has posed um, a problem with access to care. Um, the bill's really going to increase access to care for Ohioans if we can get rid of that collaborative agreement. And um, really what we've seen is that over 600 million um, Americans visit nurse practitioners across the United States alone, and passing this bill will broaden that, that um, ability so that people can have um, efficient and um, effective care when they need it. Two additional bills that um, were also ones that had an impact on care were House Bill 45, which was state programs for COVID release, which was passed last year. Um, this bill included a significant amount of funding. So I just, to, that went directly into the, the health and the care of Ohioans. So I just wanted to explain a little bit about some of the money and, and where that money went. So $500 million was um, given to federal child care spending, $350 million for nursing homes for a lump sum for payments for workforce relief. $150 million for lead abatement, including $20 million for poisoning prevention projects. $100 million went to rural hospitals, $90 million for crisis care infrastructure expansion, and then $85 million to grow behavioral health disciplines at colleges and $40 million in direct staff compensation at residential care facilities. So this bill that passed had a significant impact on the care that Ohioans are receiving. Last but not least was the Ohio Nurse Licensure Compact, which I mentioned earlier. This made Ohio the 39th state to join the compact, which standardizes the requirements for licensure across states so that nurses can practice in multiple states without having to obtain licensure in each state. The 134th General Assembly also saw a number of bills attempting to influence the scope of practice for healthcare professionals. According to the Federation of State Medical Boards, scope of practice is defined by the healthcare services a physician or healthcare practitioner is authorized to perform by virtue of professional license, registration, or certification. A healthcare professional's scope of practice um, sometimes overlaps with um, reflecting shared competencies. So these are some of the scope of practice bills that we have seen um, in the last General Assembly that I wanted to bring to your attention. Um, everyone, everyone has their own opinion about these bills. So I'm just going to give you the facts and the concerns that were raised um, on behalf of, of the nursing profession. So the very first bill we look at is House Bill 496, which um, has to do with certified professional um, midwives. The, they were seeking to expand their scope of practice, um, and they're not really trained, they're not trained in the same manner as a certified nurse midwife. So CPMs are often trained through apprenticeship, um, or they um, have a credentialing through an education program that they took through the Midwifery Education Council. Um, many certified professional midwives, they either have an associate's degree or they just have the certificate from the training of the educational um, program that they completed. Um, the bill was concerning to the nurse midwife community because it allowed for the delivery of breech twins and for vaginal birth after C-section to be performed at home by a certified professional um, midwife. And that was a concern because of safety. Additionally, the bill granted the CPM the ability to provide care for the entire family for a duration of six to eight weeks after um, delivery of the child. Um, but they're not trained in the primary or family care. So this is a scope of practice issue that, um, that we need to be aware of and that we need to, to um, voice our concerns about when necessary. 
Another bill, um, House Bill 318, looked at the ability of supervised anesthesiology assistants to develop and implement anesthesia care plans, including induction, maintenance, and emergence care, perform epidurals, along with a number of other skills that raise concerns for our certified registered nurse anesthetist um, colleagues. They also were um, looking for the ability to clear for surgery and also consent for procedures. So this bill um, raised quite a few concerns with our CRNAs. Um, a bill that benefited uh, access to care um, was House Bill 138. This was passed in the 134th General Assembly and included the ability for emergency medical service personnel to follow DNR orders, which were written by advanced practice registered nurses. This was not something that could be done before. So there's many restrictions in healthcare policy with regarding um, who has the ability to sign forms or to authorize um, certain things to be done. So at the end of this past year, there's, um, we're working on writing a bill for global signature authority to help with that. Um, what we were finding, especially even in prescriptive practice, is that there were restrictions on what APRNs could, could do for their patients, where they would need a physician signature, um, perhaps to continue care on for a patient. So this is something that, that is being worked on and hopefully will be introduced to this next General Assembly. Some examples of bills which have direct impact on our patients, um, especially when looking at the cost of healthcare, as I mentioned, is a concern, um, which was House Bill 608, which sought to require insurance companies to um, cover biomarker testing for a means of preventative screening for certain types of cancer. This bill was halted in the, um, in the House in the last General Assembly, but will likely be it reintroduced again this, this General Assembly. Another bill that's been seeking passage for um, at least the past two years, um, I believe this is the third General Assembly that this bill has been in, um, it is called the Copay Accumulator Bill. And what this bill essentially does is it requires any and all copayments made on behalf of the patient to be applied to their deductible. So many times we get um, um, savings cards, prescription savings cards. And so patients are able to utilize those prescription saving cards cards to get their prescriptions at a decreased cost, but that money was not applied to their deductible. So this bill seeks to require those um, co-payment cards to be applied to their deductible so that um, it is an advantage for the patient and it helps to reduce their healthcare expenses. Um, so looking at figure number four, this is from the Kaiser Family Foundation. It was a survey that was done in 2020, and it revealed that one in 11 adults delayed or did not get care due to the cost of health care. And as you can see from this graph here in the light blue, that's the number of patients who either delayed their care, did not care, or one or the other um, because of the cost in their if they're uninsured. So a significant number of people are avoiding healthcare based on the cost, which is again, another, um, another thing that we need to be involved in developing policies that allow people to access care when they need it. Some other issues that were also relevant to healthcare delivery um, and nursing were in regard to telemedicine. Um, so this was reimbursement and access to mental health care was another and treatment was another um, issue that we saw. Um, House Bill 122 did pass the General Assembly last year, and the intent of that bill was really to expand um, who was authorized to provide telemedicine services, and then also requiring um, insurance companies to, to provide reimbursement. So this initially started out of the um, emergency rules during the COVID-19 pandemic, but then um, the bill was expanded and was um, signed into law on March 23rd of 2022. So now this is, this is permanent. Um, so that, that expansion that occurred during emergency orders is now full law. Um, so these are the, the things that can be, can have an impact when we can see what what changes are made and how they're um, influencing care delivery, um, that results in really just establishing a background for us to be able to create more policy and to change, make um, permanent policy changes. Um, House Bill 364 and House Bill 730 are companion bills. So essentially companion bills are two bills that are introduced 
one in the House, one in the Senate, but they have the same language. And oftentimes we use that as a strategy to move policy forward. So it may um, move quicker through one um, through the House than it does through the Senate. And so if that's the case, then we kind of hang on the tails of the one that's moving more quickly. So these bills were, again, um, issues related to mental health, access to care, but also scope of practice. These bills were looking to um, propose that a certified mental health assistant should be a licensed healthcare professional who can administer care under the supervision of um, a physician. The bill would require licenses um, to be renewed every two years. And while this is wonderful in thinking about access to care in terms of, you know, the, our mental health, and, and we all are very well aware that we need more people providing um, mental health care, it's a significant concern because certified mental health assistants receive on-the-job training and only need a high school diploma in order to um to, to serve in that role. Um, so as you can see, these issues overlap with the primary issues that we first discussed, which were access to, scare, access to care, scope of practice, and cost of healthcare. Okay, one of the things I wanted to spend a little bit of time discussing also is a major problem impacting healthcare delivery in Ohio is the op opioid epidemic. On May 5th of this past year, the Ohio Department of Mental Health and Addiction Services, in collaboration with Recovery Ohio and the Ohio Department of Health, um, they announced that they were going to rapidly deploy 60,000 doses of naloxone to targeted communities in Ohio. So naloxone was distributed. There were 23 different counties across the state that received these doses um, because they were experiencing extremely high morbidity and mortality rates related to unintentional opioid overdoses. Ohio ranks number two currently in an opioid-related overdose deaths. So this was a significant move. Um, and so I've given some key resources here for information about opioid addiction and treatment. And many of these... Um, these organizations have started out of grassroots advocacy. Somebody who was uh, very passionate about the need to change and correct the care that was provided to these patients. In response to the opioid epidemic, we um, were likely to see more legislation impacting patients with substance use and abuse disorders. One example that passed just it passed in the late um, part of the General Assembly last year, it was actually in December, um, it was, um, it basically was a Good Samaritan law, which legalized fentanyl test strips, um, which um, used to be a felony um, to, to have fentanyl test strips. And it also expanded protections to people who have use or abuse disorders to call 911. So if, if I'm a person who has a substance use or abuse problem and I am, am engaging in these activities and someone I am with overdoses, I have the ability now to call 911 when, um, when this happens and not be concerned about um, repercussions of doing that. So it, it provides protection for, for people to, um, to, to uh, reach out for help um, without the fear of being arrested. So it was a hope that of this these policy actions that there be a reduction in the number of deaths related to opi opioid use. And we will likely again see more of these coming down the pike. One of the things that the governor has done um, in addition to the policies we just talked about, is he signed um, and he's been signing executive orders, which um, the, the one that I wanted to bring up because there were seven, seven medications involved was in April of last year. Um, and these executive orders usually stay in play for about six months, but it, it took these um, seven substances that um, were um, high um, high likelihood to have um, addiction, addictive, to cause addictive behaviors and um, cause problems in the community, he um, classified them as scheduled one. So schedule one controlled substances um, have no current accepted medical use and high potential for abuse. So this executive order really was pursued to reduce the risks associated with the welfare of Ohio. Um, there were similar orders signed regarding a, a tricyclic or an atypical tricyclic antidepressant, which were was signed, I believe, in the fall. And um, 
we'll see more and more of these. So basically drugs are reviewed by the State Board of Pharmacy to determine if medical benefit outweighs the risk to the public. And the executive order that the governor is signing comes from um, research. Um, so when they're seeing overdose um, deaths in arrive in hospitals across the United States, um, they're looking at the substances that are involved in these overdose deaths and these substances get flagged. So when these substances come and the Board of Pharmacy looks at the substances to classify whether or not they need to be utilized in medicine, that process can take a little while. So this executive order allows for a six month window to protect patients um, and really prevents people from writing for these medications until they're um, until they're studied further. Um, and then eventually the um, the board of pharmacy can can make these these um, permanent changes. So hopefully by now I've provided you enough information to you know, spark your curiosity about how you can be an advocate for healthcare better or um, how you can, or I've provided you a better understanding of the impact that you can have when you're involved in healthcare. So as we already talked about in, in some ways over the past several years, we've seen more rapid changes in health policy because of the COVID-19 pandemic. And as I previously mentioned, um, especially with initiating access changes in access to care, um, all of those changes are really serving as a foundational um, study for us to gather information so that we can um, make more permanent changes. So for instance, we already saw the translation of telehealth emergency use orders to become a permanent law. So another change that we saw in the pandemic was the expansion of nurse and advanced practice nurse licensure across the states. So these emergency efforts um, led to us um, accepting the nurse licensure compact and also um, will continue because we want to be able to show that um, those emergency efforts allowed for advanced practice nurses to provide safe and efficient um, care and um, hopefully will help us to convince um, the uh, stakeholders and convince policymakers that a standard care arrangement, arrangement is not necessary for advanced practice nurses in the state of Ohio and that we can provide care to patients. So this is just a map of the nursing licensure compact. And again, what this compact does is it increases access to care while maintaining public protection at the state level. So basically nurses can practice in other states that have that are part of the compact. And you can see all the states in dark blue are those states that are part of this compact. So we are at 39 currently. Now this looks um, at advanced practice registered nurses. And um, again, we're looking for uniformity as well in the care that can be provided from state to state. Um, the American Association of Nurse Practitioners is urging all professional nursing organizations across the US to introduce full practice authority legislation when they can. Um, and many states have been working on this for, for a number of years, as I mentioned earlier, Ohio's, um, I believe in their 10th, um, 10th year to try to remove the standard care arrangement. But this map represents the current practice environment in the US and the green states are those that allow for nurse practitioners to um, authorize um, the um, evaluation, diagnose, treatment, um, looking at orders, uh, writing for orders, interpreting tests, um, initiating management and maintaining management for patient care. Yellow states are those that have at least one barrier in one of those areas, whether it be prescriptive practice, whether it be writing of orders for diagnostic procedures, um, the, those states in yellow um, are have a barrier there. And then the states in red actually have a restriction, meaning that they cannot do one of those um, mentioned tasks um, or list tasks here of, di of interpretation of tests, diagnosing, diagnosing patients, or um, managing or initiating treatments. So um, I encourage all of you to get involved as an advocate for the profession. Um, Ohio really has just started its new General Assembly, as I mentioned previously, and this the very beginning of the General Assembly oftentimes um, focuses just on budgetary concerns. So we'll likely see many of the bills with regards to scope of practice and access to care and those things that affect our patients in terms of cost, we're going to start seeing those bills drop. We call it, we drop into the hopper, usually in March um, is when we'll start to see that new legislation um, um, 
come out. So one of the things that I wanted to show you here is a number of resources just to kind of get involved. I realize that this can be very overwhelming, um, especially if you haven't been involved in advocacy efforts before. Um, but once bills are introduced, they'll be assigned a number. So the bill numbers that I provided for you today were the bills, bill numbers for the bills in the General Assembly last year. Giving you an example, the Health um, Better Access to Better Care Act that I said is in its fourth uh, or going into its fifth General Assembly to be introduced um, last year had a different number. The year before that had a different number. So those numbers are associated with the General Assembly that we're currently in. Um, so just be aware of that. But as you do that, you'll see that um, on the, the Ohio General Assembly website, and you can just Google Ohio General Assembly, it'll pull the 135th General Assembly, and you can type in the number of the bill that you are interested in. So if you're in a professional organization and that you, you hear that a bill has been um, introduced and you know the bill number, you can go here and type in the number of the bill, and it'll pull up the document itself, how it was introduced, any status of the legislation, if it's been assigned to committee, if it's in the House, if it's in the Senate, it'll tell you where that bill is. Um, you can see that there's a drop down um, here too. Hopefully my arrow is working, but there's a drop down here where it has 135th. You can actually select the arrow and drop down to 134th and look at any of those bill numbers that I mentioned to you today if you want more detail. There's a lot kind of buried in those bills, so I just kind of went over the 30,000 foot view of those, but feel free to go through and, and take a look at that. Um, the other really great um, uh, resource for legislation is called Legiscan. Uh, it's a free website that you can register for and it allows you to search not only by bill number, but it allows you to search by topic. So you can just put in nursing or pediatrics or opioid or whatever your topic of interest is, you can search for legislation through Legiscan. Um, and you can also see here you have the option to go and look at other years or prior years as well. So you can um, use your username and email address. And this is not one of those websites that inundates you with email. So you're not going to get something every single day. Um, but it's a really good place, again, to go look at status of legislation, any revisions that might have been made. Um, so it's a really great resource. Some other ways you can get involved are just if you aren't already um, joining a national organization such as AANP or American Academy of Nurses, both of those organizations hold um, annual health policy conferences. And for whatever reason, most, most uh, policy conferences on the national level have a tendency to be in like late winter to early spring. So usually February or March is a, is a good opportunity to, to look at those. And the, they'll talk a lot more about federal initiatives, um, which I didn't mention today and stayed more on Ohio initiatives. Federal initiatives have a tendency to trickle down. So what we see happen in Washington will eventually trickle down into the state. So it's just something to be aware of that when you go to health policy conferences, thinking about the bills that are of importance or the issues that are of importance at the federal level, even if we're not seeing them at the state quite yet, we probably will. Um, so it's just, just something to, to bear in mind. Um, there are also um, the national, or I'm sorry, Nurses Day at the State House usually happens every February or March. I did look for information. Um, that link is the, the link that they usually use. There's not in, any information posted yet about this year, um, but it's a one day state level event that usually is put on by the Ohio Nurses Association. Um, and what it allows for is it allows for nurses to have an opportunity to eat lunch with legislators to talk about some of the important um, initiatives that are going on. Um, and it, it just gives you an opportunity to start to build um, to build a rapport and to build a relationship with your legislators. So it, it's a great experience. Um, and you can even utilize that time to go and meet individually with your legislator if you choose. And then if all of these seem really overwhelming to you, one of the things that I would encourage you to is it is to um, contribute to your political action committee. So you may see, you know, asks for money. Well, it, 
it does take money to pass a bill. So um, it's a significant cost in these organizations paying the lobbyists and um, supporting um, sponsorship for our legislators. All of those things cost money. And so that political action committee funding usually goes to those efforts to make sure that the, the bill can uh, get through. Um, and just kind of in closing, I wanted to give you some links. So you can see um, here that AANP has advocacy resource page. They have a toolkit. So if you're a member of AANP, you can log on there, um, log into your, your uh, account, and then you can get access to different information um, about, uh, again, issues, what's happening across. You can look at different states, surrounding states, and see what issues are there. Um, ANA also, American Associ Association has a wonderful policy and advocacy site um, with lots of information on how to become a grassroots advocate, what are the issues at hand, um, and they even have um, oftentimes a call to action, so they'll have a letter that you can fill out that gets sent to your representative um, or your congressman. Um, based on the issues. So I got a lot of letters from AANP when the home um, health care bill was passing in the at the federal level, um, calls to action to send a letter through just saying, please support this bill, please support this bill. So you'll get those um, through these organizations. American Association of Nurse Anesthetists also has um, a wonderful advocacy um, page, as well as the American Association of Colleges of Nursing. And as you saw in those domains, you know, if you are an educator, if you're working at UC or anywhere, um, you know, across the, the United States, um, really making sure that your nurses are feeling a little bit more adept in what health policy means, what it has to do for our patients, what it does for our profession alone. Um, but these are, there, there are links embedded here. I'm not sure, Gage, if I can somehow try to get this to you. I know it was kind of a big file, so I had trouble sending it to Gage, but I'm not sure if there's a way to get this out to the people who are on today. Um, but uh, I found this quote, and I think it's perfect for what we just talked about. You know, words mean more than what is set, set down on paper. It takes the human voice to infuse them with deeper meaning. And when I read this quote, I thought a lot about, you know, sometimes we feel like one person can't make much of a difference. But um, I think the, the thing that stands out to me the most is Lindsay's Law, which if you're a parent, if you're a being a nurse, you know, most of us have seen Lindsay's Law for concussion. And that was th the efforts of one started by one person. Um, and that is such an important legislative effort that happened. Um, so it can be one person to tell their story really has an influence. So I encourage you all to, to um, get, get more involved if you're not and reach out to me if you want to be. So thank you so much for listening.